So I'm going to tell you a story, as I always do. A few months ago, we were looking for some new board members for the company. And one of our board members, and this is the way it works, said, I know this gentleman, this incredible man in Arizona, who may be interested in learning about the company and then joining the board of directors. Now, he didn't come to meet us and meet me with the intention of joining our board. He came with the intention, basically, of fulfilling a wish of another man. To basically say, well, I'll do the favor for you. I don't really want to join this Herbalife company. But I'll come, and I'll see, and then I'll go away, and I'll say thank you very much. So just like so many people, he came to see us. And I had the incredible honor of taking him on a tour. And I call this my magic carpet ride in Herbalife. And so we took him to a nutrition club where he met a young distributor operating her club, serving customers, having a community experience like Mark and Jill just spoke about, watching the women come in to go for their 10 o'clock walk, have their shakes, come back, be part of a social fabric in a community. We then went down to our distribution center where hundreds of distributors were coming in to fulfill their orders and take their products out, many of them Spanish-speaking. And he spoke in his native tongue Spanish to them, as he did in the club. Then we went to a fit club. We went to a facility where people were exercising and having a community experience together. And it was incredibly special. And then we went to the Herbalife Science Center, where he met our doctors. And he had a chance to talk about things that I don't know anything about, but I'm fast learning, the microbiome, which is the future of our company, which we're very excited about, the places we're going to go with nutrition and the things we're going to do. And then he came up and met our executives. And the excitement was felt by him as it penetrated our hallways and into the boardroom, the Mark Hughes boardroom, as we sat with him, and he got an understanding of the passion that we all feel about what we do here at Herbalife. Now, I'm going to give you a little background here, and I'm going to do a little reading, so out come these little bad boys here. I mean, you know, sorry. It's what the gray hairs and the eyes do together over time. Doggone it. Born to a poor Hispanic family in New York City. He experienced homelessness, hunger, and health disparities during his youth. This guy was born in a tough time in a tough place. The experiences greatly sensitized him to the relationships among culture, health, education, and economic status, and it shaped his future thinking about people needing a chance and an opportunity. He dropped out of high school, he enlisted in the U.S. Army in 1967. While serving, he earned his general equivalency diploma, meaning in the United States, he got his degree. He got his high school degree while he was in the Army. He went on to become a combat-decorated Special Forces veteran. After he left active duty, he went to a community college, a local college. For those of you who don't understand the United States, these are not big, fancy institutions. These are where normal people go to get an education to further themselves in their lives. A very special thing. I went to a community college for a little while, so I understand that experience. He attended the Bronx Community College of the City University of New York through an open enrollment program for veterans, so he went to school based on his career. He received an Associate of Arts degree. That's what you get from a two-year school in the United States. Then he attended the University of California in San Francisco where he received a Bachelor of Science degree in 1977 and a medical degree in 1979. Not just any medical degree, but he was the, uh, awarded the prestigious gold-headed cane as the top graduate in his medical school. All right, let's start over here. High school dropout, top graduate in medical school. This is a man who knows how to move up. You know, he'd be a Founder Circle member if he were in here, right? He would be at the top. He was trained in general and vascular surgery. 
He completed a National Institutes of Health sponsored fellowship in trauma, burns, critical care, specialties. He was recruited by the Tucson Arizona Medical Center and the University of Arizona to start and direct Arizona's first regional trauma care system, meaning when people get in trouble, accidents, whatever, they come there. And this guy, he's the man. He takes care of you. He set up the whole program. He went on to become the chairman of the state of Arizona Southern Regional Emergency Medical System, a professor of surgery. He started and founded the Pima County Sheriff's Department of surgery and worked with that to help create a medical response team in the SWAT team there. Those are the special weapons and tactical units team. This is a real badass, or a bad guy. I was gonna say badass, but I won't go there, all right? Badass. 28 years, 28 years in the Pima County Sheriff's Department in Tucson Deputy Sheriff, Detective, SWAT Team Leader, Department Surgeon, cool, cool stuff. In 2002, he was nominated by the President of the United States of America and unanimously confirmed by the United States Senate, unanimously confirmed, that doesn't happen much around our country anymore, to become the 17th Surgeon General of the United States of America. He was selected because of his extensive experience in public health, clinical sciences, healthcare management, preparedness, and his commitment to prevention, prevention as an effective means to improve public health and reduce healthcare costs while improving the quality and the quantity of life. As Surgeon General, he focused on prevention, preparedness, health disparities, health literacy, global health to include health diplomacy. He also issued many landmark Surgeon General communications during his tenure, including the definitive Surgeon General's report about the dangers of secondhand smoke. He's published extensively, received numerous awards, decorations, local and national recognitions for his achievements. He's a strong supporter of community service and has served on community and public and private national boards, providing leadership to many diverse groups. He has a list of medals he won, Purple Hearts National Medal of Valor, this is a very cool guy. After our meeting with him, we went back and we had a conversation. And he said something interesting to me. He said, what you are doing at Herbalife is what I wanted to do as the Surgeon General of the United States of America. What you're doing here. He. He then agreed to become a board member of Herbalife because of what you do, because of your distribution network, because of the lives you change. Would you please give a warm welcome for Herbalife board member, the 17th Surgeon General of the United States of America, Dr. Richard Carmona. Ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all so much. As we used to say in the military, hoorah! I am not a badass. I'm a guy who's gotten pretty lucky and now have a bigger family than I ever had in Herbalife. So thank you. Thank you. Please uh, sit down, relax for a minute. I want to tell you a couple of stories. I want to tell you how happy I am to be here, how proud I am to be associated with you. But most importantly, I, I want to thank somebody because it was Michael Johnson and a board member that I know who's on your board who had the foresight to say, Rich would be interested in this company. Mike told you the story, and I did it, as Michael said, as of a courtesy. I thought, you know, I, I'm on too many boards now. I'm too busy. My executive assistant actually had said to me, if you join another board, I'm quitting. So I thought I couldn't do it. But like Michael said, what I saw was absolutely extraordinary. And the conversation that I had with him after that first and second day and meeting all of you, going to a distribution center, speaking to so many people, 
And that's when I said to him, if I had known Herbalife when I was Surgeon General, it was the thing I lacked to connect to the people. It was the distribution network for health over the whole world that I could have been much more successful. That was really my only regret. But I said, I got a chance now to join them. Thank you. Thank you. Let me tell you more, because I remember sitting in the car with Michael, and I looked to him after I visited, and I said, you don't understand what you have here. Your products are excellent. The science is wonderful. The docs are tremendous. The people have passion and compassion, and they're diverse. It's a global opportunity. But I said, you don't really understand what you have here. This is not just a, a company about a product. This is a company about a culture, about lifestyle. It is a distribution network globally for public health. And that's what you guys do. So let me tell you a little bit about myself and why I'm so pleased to be here. You heard a little bit about my background. You know, it, it's, um, it's always challenging for me when People look at my resume. I don't like to talk about myself. In half of my first half of my life, I was a miserable failure. I let down a lot of people. And I wasn't proud of that. But I live in a great country that offers you opportunity, like Herbalife does to so many people. It's about opportunity for everybody. <laughs> but that day with Michael was transformative. So I want to give you a little about my background so you can see my passion how I see the world, tell you a little bit about the disease and economic burden in the world, and how you all, every single one of you who make the commitment here with our company and our family can be a, a solution for not only our nation, but your nations and the world. And I'll make that case for you in the next few minutes. The Surgeon General of the United States has a very easy job description on paper to protect, promote, and advance the health safety and security of the United States. You are the chief doctor of the United States. On paper, it sounds very easy. Try and do the job in that very political environment that you read about every day. I'm a combat veteran, and I felt safer being in real combat than in Washington on an everyday basis. My parents were immigrants like many of you. My parents spoke English as a second language. They spoke Spanish first. And I grew up in a house that spoke Spanglish, OK? Uh, muchas gracias y bienvenidos a todos. <laughs> Thank you. Like many of you, you understand the importance of family and an immigrant family. And what held us together was my grandmother, and in Spanish, grandma is abuelita, OK? Abuelita was five foot tall and about 90 pounds soaking wet, but the toughest woman I've ever met in my whole life. And she's the one that gave us our passion for life, who told us that this was a country that was filled with opportunity. And yes, we're poor, and it's tough. Unfortunately, my abuelita died at an early age, and we lived in Harlem in New York City. For those of you in New York City, it's, that's the hood, OK? Yet, we were all poor. On my block, I didn't know anybody who graduated from high school. If you had a high school graduate, it was a reportable event in my neighborhood. <laughs> but we were happy kids. We went out and played. We played stickball. There was no organized things. Mom, we didn't have cars. We didn't get driven any place. You went out in the street and played. You played stickball. We went to the park. I learned to swim in the Harlem River in New York. That's why I'm so healthy, because I've been exposed to every pathogen known to mankind. <laughs> Some of you have seen the Harlem River, I guess, right? Is that it? <laughs> my mom was a wonderful lady who tried to hold us together. And both my mom and pop had problems with alcohol and substance. They struggled. 
My mom was almost a single mom because my pop was a, a guy in the street a lot. Good, both good people, but they struggled. They had those demons. And mom, through all of her problems, she never forgot her kids. She made us read. She took us to the library. She used to go in her purse. We didn't have any money. And she'd hold up her library card, and she'd say, this is the most important thing I own because it connects me with the world. It teaches me about the world. And she'd bring whole books, and she'd make us read. And she'd ask us about world events, and she'd ask us about things. She taught herself five languages and never got past high school. She was extraordinary. You know, I, I wish she was here now to hear Michael say the nice things about me, to be honest with you. Thank you. But mom, mom was a woman before her times, back in the 50s and 60s when I was, you know, a little guy. She'd make us sit at the table at night. We lived in a little tenement, roach infested, mice, single light bulb from the ceiling, a little metal table. And she'd make the kids sit there, and she would talk to us about the world and about history and making our name for ourselves. And we don't have to be this way if we get an education, because she said, they'll take everything else away from you, but if you get educated, they can't take that from you. And she would say things to me that I didn't understand at the time. You know, she'd say, mijito, listen to me. Yeah, mom, okay. And she'd tell me about the world and leaders and wars. And, and I remember a couple of conversations. She said, Richard, and she spoke in Spanglish. She said, Richard, how many wars have women started? I said, mom, I don't know what you're talking about. She said, how many? I said, Mom, I don't know. She said, Richard, listen to me. Women don't start wars. We are peacemakers. It's you guys that start the wars. <laughs> Me bueno, huh? <laughs> but here's the important thing. The important thing that she said, and it, it, I learned so much because decades later, I finally realized how smart she really was. Because she said to me one day, and then she said it many times to me, she said, Richard, when you get older, and you assume positions of responsibility. I was just trying to get out of high school, OK? But she, she sees my future long before I did. She saw potential in me I didn't see. She said, Richard, remember this. When women have an equal seat at the table of leadership, the world will be a healthier, safer, more secure place. She said that all the time. <laughs> And I, I never understood it, but certainly later when I did get into those leadership positions, I saw what she was trying to explain to me over those years. For a while, we were homeless, in and out, lived with Abuelita, lived with Tio Sitias. I was on the street for a while, and I had no place to go. And yet, in a country that offers opportunity, it was the US Army that gave me a chance, because who else would take a child with no education, no training, no experience, and so this was 1967. Vietnam War was picking up, and I went to the recruiter. He gave me a big hug, said, sit down, son. He gave me tests. Came back the next day, he said, my God, you are smart, son. He said, if you just sign this paper, the Army's going to take care of you. And he said to me, if you join us, we will make you all you can be. He didn't lie, because they gave me an opportunity. They taught me how to be a citizen. They taught me how to be disciplined. They taught me how to stay focused on a mission. They taught me how to complete a mission. They taught me about selfless service, the privilege of serving your country, and sometimes even putting your life on the line for that. It's a privilege to be able to do that. But as an 8, 17, 18, 19 year old kid, you don't understand it. Now I look back at that gift they gave me because it's the platform I use for all my life and everything that I do. As I move forward, thank you. My mother always used to say to us in Spanglish, I just want to live long enough to go to one of my children's graduation. She only meant high school because nobody had been out of high school. Nobody. But my two brothers, my sister, and I all failed her because we all dropped out. But every one of us in second and third chances eventually got out of high school. My brother followed me in the Army. He stayed 30 years. My other brother stayed in the workspace, and he got a night school diploma. My sister the same way. We persevered because we recognized that, you know, life isn't easy. And the only difference between a person that fails and succeeds 
is that the person that succeeds gets up one more time. That's the bottom line. And I learned that in the military. I learned that in special forces. So as I went through life, I thought I'm going to make the military a career. That didn't turn out right because my colleagues, after I came back from combat, I was wounded in combat. I was fortunate I came back. 58,000 of my brothers didn't. And I don't know if we have a lot to show for it. But nevertheless, I came back and I thought I was going to make a career in the Army and Special Forces. But my colleagues kept telling me, Richard, you ought to go to college. You're a smart kid. I was a Special Forces medic and a weapon specialist. I had treated, delivered babies in combat. I took care of gunshot wounds. I took care of explosions. I took care of parasitic disease, all before I was 20 years old in combat. So the experience and the responsibility was extraordinary. But I knew I couldn't go to college, and it was embarrassing because I didn't have a diploma. I didn't, I didn't have a transcript. I didn't take SATs. So finally, they kept badgering me so much, I said, all right, I'll do it. And my plan was I would apply to college, and I know I'm going to get rejected, and I'll take that humbly. It'll be an embarrassment, but they'll leave me alone, and then I'll continue my career in Special Forces. So I applied, and I got rejected to every school I applied to. And then I got a letter from the Bronx Community College that said, congratulations. And I said, oh, shit, I got to go to college now. <laughs> I was like, I'm not sure how that translates into Korean, so I apologize if it got missed. So, <laughs> so <laughs> I hope you got the gist. Anyway, anyway, and I, I went to college, and it was a very humbling experience because I'm, I'm in my 20s, but I feel like I'm 40. I've been through combat. I've been wounded in combat. I lost friends. I, you know, and, and here I am taking remedial courses with smart 18 and 19-year-old kids. But I stuck to it. I lived through it. I became an A student, ultimately got to the four-year school, ultimately did very well in college, but I had to work. So many of you probably have heard, I've been a, besides a soldier, I've been an ocean lifeguard, a paramedic, a registered nurse, a physician assistant, a police officer, homicide detective, SWAT, SWAT team leader. And so a lot of people joke, well, so what? That's just a guy that couldn't keep a job. And, <laughs> and probably that's true, but I can tell you what, many years later when I became the Surgeon General of the United States, I was probably the best prepared Surgeon General in history because of all the experiences I had. I then had that lofty dream. I said, you know, I might as well go for it. I have a job. I was working one or two jobs all the time, and I thought, let me apply to medical school. I applied, and I was fortunate. I got into several. I went to the University of California. I was the happiest kid in medical school. For the docs, my colleagues are in the audience. They'll tell you, medical students are always complaining. There's too many books, too much to read, too much work. There's a paper chase. You know, they're, they're all anally compulsive. I was relaxed. I mean, you know, when you've been in combat and you're at death's doorstep, a test doesn't scare you anymore, OK? And so I did real well, and I did so well that I skipped my last year of medical school, and I graduated number one in my class at the University of California. <laughs> and, and unfortunately, you know, um, my mom never got to see me graduate from high school. But I went ahead and I trained in general vascular surgery, subspecialized in trauma and burns and critical care, and I thought that's all I was going to do my whole life. I promised my family I'd given up being a police officer, but I kept doing it every year, and I did one more year, and 28 years later, I was still doing both jobs. But I love them. You don't, you don't go into law enforcement or the military for the money. You have to have the passion, and you love the camaraderie, and the friendship, and the kinship that develops that no money in the world can give you that experience. And for those of you who know people in the military and know people that serve our communities like firemen and policemen, it's one of the greatest things that you can do. And so I had great pride, and I, I love doing that. Thank you. Thank you. So I, for my doctor friends and health professionals in the room, you know, I, I ended up a general vascular surgeon. I subspecialized in trauma burns and critical care. And as Michael said, I got recruited from the University of California to the University of Arizona to start the first trauma program. Now, the problem with being a surgeon, as probably people here know, is that when you ask a surgeon to name the best three surgeons in the world, they always have trouble naming the other two. <laughs> it's 
See, there, there's the late translation. See, it's coming in. So I did that, and I thought that was the end of it. But I got antsy again, and I wanted more education. So when I was a professor, I went back to night school and got a master's degree because I needed to know more about business. I needed to know more about the business of public health. And that's when I got the call that Michael told you about, that voicemail late at night that said, Dr. Carmona, this is, gave his name, from White House personnel. Would you please call us about a job? And I put down the phone, the first thing I did, it started laughing because I thought these goddamn cops and firemen that I worked with would do for nothing stop embarrassing me. <laughs> because there was no reason for the White House to call me. I've been independent my whole life. I've been very critical of both parties. And as you can see in our country, it's quite dysfunctional and the criticism is merited, okay? <laughs> so so why, why would they call me? I mean, I wasn't buying into either side, to be honest with you. But you know, I thought, there's no downside. I'll call this kid tomorrow and I'll find out what's going on. And I called him, he says, oh yeah, Dr. Carmona, this is so-and-so from White House personnel, we'd like to talk to you. Would you like to be considered for a job? And I listened to him talk, and I said, well, what's the job? He said, the president's gonna announce this week he's recruiting for a new United States Surgeon General. Since you've been in the military and have a lot of experience, we'd like to know if you'd be willing to be considered. So I'm holding the phone and I was laughing, okay? And I thought, surely this means there's another Rich Carmona in the country, and they got the wrong one. So I said, okay, I'll say yes. In a couple of weeks, they'll find out they got the wrong guy, but I'll go to Washington, I'll meet some people, and you know, I'll learn something. So I went through the process. That's exactly why, and every day, my friends and I would laugh, the cops, the firemen, the docs I work with, because they, you know, people would say, why would they pick you? I said, I don't know. <laughs> So, so I went through the process and eventually you do telephonic interviews and then you get to where you're meeting with famous people in Washington. And then one day you wake up and you're on the front page. And I'm on the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, uh, um, USA Today, there's a picture of me and of course the media always plays it up. So instead of a doctor picture, they have a picture of me rappelling from a helicopter in a SWAT team here, okay? But, but they say, Carmona on short list for Surgeon General. Now, they never tell you how short the list is, okay? But what happens is, that day, you become a public figure. And then the, the, the whole process becomes intrusive and sometimes malicious. Because you, they, start, they start relating you to things that happened before you were born, crimes that occurred in your neighborhood, you know, and they, and, and if they, and they, and they say whatever they want to say because you're a public figure. So you hang in there. And eventually I got through the process, I went through that, and I'll tell you the actual story, I hope I don't offend anybody, I wanna tell you exactly what happened. After a few of those interviews, I made up a little card, a three by five card, I had it in my pocket, and I called it my rejection speech with dignity, because I knew they weren't gonna give me the job. And on the paper, I wrote a paragraph that said, thank you for the opportunity. This is when they tell me, you know, they'll, they call you and they tell you you're a great guy, but then at the last 30 seconds they say, but, we're not gonna take you, we're gonna take somebody else. So I had this note that said, um, well, please tell the president I appreciate being considered. If there's any other uniform positions, I'd be happy to be considered, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So finally, we're getting down, and I know it's getting close. One day I get a call, it's the chief of staff at the White House, and he says, Dr. Carmona, I said, yes. I took out my card, I put it down. He says, we'd like to know what you're doing on March 26th. I said, who's we? He said, uh, the president and the cabinet were like, you know, March 26th. I said, oh, okay. He said, well, wait, wait. He said, we really want to know what your family, especially your children are doing. And I thought, oh, hell, they want to interview my kids. I'll never get the job. <laughs> I really didn't think I was going to get the job, truthfully. I didn't because there was no reason to give it to me. And then he said to me, uh, well, Dr. Carmona, I probably should have started differently. We just had a meeting with the president and cabinet members that are interested. Uh, the president would like to know with you and your family come to the White House on March 26th, where he will announce that you will be his nominee. Can't even say it anymore. For Surgeon General of the United States. And I said something very intelligent. I said, you're shitting me.
And, yeah, and he said, no, sir, I'm not. So your life changes, you know? You go from being anonymous to being potentially the doctor of the nation. You eventually have to go through Senate confirmation. It's a long, arduous process. You get beat up pretty good. It's a combat zone. But then I became the first Surgeon General in history to be confirmed unanimously by the, by the US Senate. Thank you. 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 So, it, you know, it's been an extraordinary journey for me. You know, I'll tell you a funny story. When I became Surgeon General, you're in uniform all the time. You're an admiral. And so I'm all over the world. And when I got a weekend off, and I flew back to Arizona. And I hadn't seen my kids. I was tired. The plane, I land in the plane. I get off. I take my uniform off. And I put my usual uniform is a t-shirt and running shorts and my workout clothes. Because, um, you know, like the rest of you, I work out all the time. I eat healthy. That's just my life. So my kids are at the house with their friends. And they say, hey, Dad, great to see you. You know, why don't you come to lunch with us? I said, yeah, let's go. So I take the Suburban. There's about 10 kids in the car. And we go to their favorite fast food place. Now, remember, I'm Surgeon General now. So we go in, and they all go order their big meals and all the stuff. And, you know, and everybody knows me at home. So I step in, and it's a cr lunchtime, and it's crowded. And as soon as I step in, I'm a t-shirt and shorts and everything, and everybody's looking at me, just like you guys are. And it's like you feel like you're a naked Surgeon General. You know, they're kind of like, oh, my god. So I go to the far table in the back. And that's probably pre-programmed, because most cops, when they eat, they go to the back table and put their back to the wall. And, but I went there because I wanted to stay below the radar. So the kids go buy all their food, and they come back. And they said, do you want to eat? Oh, no, 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 no. So my son has his big meal in front of him. He pushes it in front of me. Now, everybody's watching me in that restaurant. And he's got the supersized fries, you know? <laughs> so he, throw, and instinct, he throws me the fry. And, and instinctively, I pick the fry up. Everybody in the restaurant's watching me, OK? <laughs> so I drop the French fry. I drop the French fry. <laughs> so, so I tell my son, I say, Rob, Dad's got this new job, and we cannot do this French fry thing in public anymore. It just ain't going to work. So your life changes. You become a very, you know, a public figure. One more story, and I want to take, get to a couple of other things. I was at a press conference early in my term as Surgeon General. And they were asking me about everything from weapons of mass destruction and terrorism and food and acupuncture and zen and obesity. And then, you know, the reporters in the beginning, they always ask you. It was funny. It was almost, I, you know, I should have been shocked, but they'd ask you questions like, well, how come they picked you? How are you Surgeon General, you know? It was like they're, they're saying they made a mistake, you know? And so I never had an answer. I'd say, well, I don't know. I went through the process. I interviewed. I was professional as I could be. And then one day I just was feeling a bit funny. <laughs> and in the press conference, the reporter said, so... Surgeon General Carmona, did you know the president? Did you know the secretary? How, you know, you kind of came out of nowhere. How did you become the Surgeon General of the United States? And I said, ma'am, let me tell you why. I said, I think the reason is it's probably the most far-fetched and unusual in federal hiring practices. I was qualified. <laughs> <laughs> The, the White House press office called me after that. They didn't think it was very funny. I thought it was pretty damn funny, actually. So, all right. So with all of that, why join Herbalife? I sit on many boards. I have small companies that I'm developing, you know, mining science. I, I, I have so much opportunity now. I am so lucky that I live in this great country that afforded me all of these opportunities after I fail so miserably that I had a mom that was strong and an abuelita that was strong that believed in me when I didn't believe in myself, that I stayed up. And I, every time I got knocked down, I got back up when it was important, not because I had the strength, but because people around me, teachers, mentors, counselors, mother, grandmother, all saw something in me that I didn't see in myself. And I had opportunity. And you know, when I look at Herbalife, all I see is opportunity. Because anybody can come into the company with nothing and start 
and you can work as hard as you want and build something. You can transform your community. You can make people healthy, and you can make a damn good living if you're willing to work hard. It's opportunity, and that's what our nation is all about. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. When I first met Michael and we had the discussion, one of the things that I, I said to him, as I told you, and I want to reiterate this, I said, Michael, this is not about a fit club or a nutrition club or a shake. This is a freaking public health distribution network. I've never seen anything like this. I, I remember a Surgeon General having the bully pulpit, being the doctor of 300 million people, having world presence. I could bring crowds together, and I can talk to them, and I can try and convince them to do something healthy, eat healthy, exercise, whatever. But can I sustain it? Or when I go away, do they forget it? You have a distribution network that, devel that delivers content, delivers product, and then there's sustainable change. I've been to those nutrition centers. I've been to the Fit Center and seen people who are losing weight, seen people who are healthy, seen people who are making a living, seen people who hire their brother, their sister, their mother, and bring them in, and you have a small economy that's growing. That's something we should be damn proud of in this country. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. As I told Michael that day, the only regrets that I have as it relates to, to Herbalife was that when I was a child and my abuelita and my mom were struggling, that we didn't have something like Herbalife that we could have gotten involved in to pull us out of poverty, to make a living, to eat every night, to have a stable life. But now we have that here. And the other thing that I regret is, as a Surgeon General, I didn't know Michael, I didn't know all of you. Because had I, had I known you, I would have humbly come to the biggest meeting you had and asked you to let me partner with you and join your family so we can get this good information out and these good products and healthy things and change behaviors, not only in the US, but the world that you all represent. That's what we need to do. Thank you. Thank you. As we look out on the world today, we, let's look at the United States. We spend 18% of our gross domestic product on what we call health care. It's not health care, folks. It's sick care. Okay? 75 cents of every dollar that we spend in this country is on chronic disease, most of which are preventable, and most of which are made worse or caused by obesity. Within the Herbalife family, the distribution network that we have, we can change that, not only in the nation, but in the world. Now, we're not the only, I'm not saying we only, we're the only ones that have the solution, but we have a damn good distribution network with lots of smart people like you, a good product, and again, it's not about the product, it's about how we use it. It's walking with those mothers and those kids and grandmas and grandpas and eating healthy, and that transforms behavior, and over time, you see obesity go down, cost of care goes down, quality of life goes up. I think within the model that we have, not only do we have a wonderful economic model, but we also have an extraordinary health model. And we need to do a better job of telling the world about that. We are a great company. We are poised for extraordinary growth. But today we're unfairly challenged. In Special Forces, they always used to tell us, when the going gets tough, the tough get going. We will come out an even stronger, better, more efficient, more effective company because of these unfair challenges. So we welcome them, because we will be better when we come out the other end. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let me wrap it up, let me wrap it up now. You know, another thing they used to tell us in, in Special Forces, the Special Forces training is the hardest in the military. My class started with over 130, we graduated about 30 a couple of years later. And to earn that Green Beret, you pay a big price. Lots of pain, lots of times in swamps and valleys and hungry, 
But when you come out the other end, you know that you can accomplish any mission, any mission at all. You understand resources, you understand cost benefit, and so on. But they used to tell us all the time, when times got tough, the only easy day was yesterday. Okay? Tomorrow is before us. So remember, we all need you to stay focused on the mission. Be, each and every one of you should be able to articulate our vision and our mission with clarity, health literate, so that every person that you know can understand it at the grassroots level. Our scientists can talk about the genome and the epigenome. They can talk about genetics. They can talk about molecular stuff. That's great, because that's the science, as Michael said, that's going to drive the company and make us even bigger and better and badder in the future. But it's you all that operate where the rubber meets the road at the ground level. You have to be able to bring resonant messages to those people that you are working with to effect sustainable behavioral change. Not only about product, but changing health, changing behavior. It's a big package that we need. You all have the power to do that. You have to be able to concisely articulate it. That's why our scientific advisory board, our big board that I'm on, Michael directing us, looking at that and saying, OK, let's get our messaging down. Let's make sure that every one of our distributors, members, un knows what it is we can say and what we can't say. So we don't have people accusing us of things. All of you know that already. We just have to be more, more disciplined about those messages. And you hear more about that now. Michael Johnson, me and the board know that our strength globally is in our integrity, our culture, our products. But most important, it's about each and every one of you. Because each and every one of you are our premier salesman. You're the one that represents us. You're the one in your communities and your families that talk about the company with passion. It's you. So we can set the platform. The board loves you guys. We talk about it all the time. We want to give you the tools. We want to inspire you. But we know if we turn you loose, we can transform this world. We just have to get our messages clear. So get out and email. I want you to do this. Listen to me. I want you to tweet. I want you to email. I want you to use every social platform you can. And every single day, send out 10 messages. Send them to your friends, send them to the media. Tell them your herbal life story. Tell them how herbal life has transformed you. Tell them about the opportunity that you received to make yourself healthier, your family healthier, your community. Tell them about the economic development, the prosperity that you've appreciated because you're willing to work hard with a company that gives you those opportunities. Help us make the case for herbal life in the world. Every single one of you has connections. Use them. Get the word out about these great stories. Michael and I and the board hear them all the time. But they're secret, guys. We just tell each other. Tell the world. Be proud of this. I know you are, but get it out there to everybody so we can transform this company. Thank you. Thank you. Make. Make no mistake, we can and we will make the world a healthier place while delivering enormous value to you and your communities. I am ecstatic and proud to be part of your Herbalife family. I thank you for the warm welcome and treating me as if I was one of your children. I'm thrilled to be with you. You have all been so kind to me to give me this warm welcome. Now it's time to move onward Let's show the world the great company that Herbalife is. Thank you very much.